This video is sponsored by Brilliant. In our everyday lives, we experience and observe three spatial dimensions. We can move left to right, up and down, and then forward and back. If you wanted to tell me to meet you somewhere, even outside the Earth, three numbers is all I'd need. But this isn't quite complete, because if I wanted to meet you for lunch, let's say, I would need three numbers, like a longitude, a latitude, and the floor to meet you on, but I'd also need a time. Because we need this fourth value to completely specify some event in the universe, we consider time to be the fourth dimension. Now time is not a spatial dimension that extends beyond height, length, and width, but rather it's called a temporal dimension. It doesn't behave like the other dimensions, and we definitely can't point in the direction of time, let's say, since we're embedded in 3D space. But in simplest terms, since we need that fourth value of time to specify an event, we consider it to be the fourth dimension. Now, we used to think space and time were totally independent, but then Einstein came along and found that's not the case. They were in fact linked together. And the mathematical model that fuses these two things became known as space-time. What Einstein's general theory of relativity says is that massive objects curve space-time. This means that distances between points and also times between events are warped around massive objects. And this has strange consequences like time ticking differently on different planets and massless photons being bent by massive objects because of that curvature. The equations that describe all this can definitely look intimidating. But really, what you see is on one side of this equation is math regarding the geometry or curvature of space-time, and on the other side we have an expression that has to do with mass and energy. The famous saying by physicist John Wheeler is that space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. Now, in order to understand more of the underlying mathematics behind how our universe really works, we need to take a closer look at the word curvature. Because in general, we tend to think that something's curved if it's simply not flat. So for example, most people would tell you, this is curved, but this is not. However, there's more than one way to define curvature. And something we're going to investigate more of is Gaussian curvature, which might not be exactly what you'd expect. For example, when it comes to Gaussian curvature, this and this are the exact same. Or something I'm sure many of you guys know is that you cannot have a world map that perfectly represents a globe without some distortion. And the reason behind this has to do with Gaussian curvature. But moving to the actual math, a piece of paper has zero Gaussian curvature, which is probably no surprise. But why is that? It's because at any point, if I draw a little line segment in any direction, it's completely flat. So we say that has zero curvature. Then if I draw another segment perpendicular, we see the same thing, zero curvature. And when we multiply them, we of course get zero, which is the Gaussian curvature at that point, and that would apply to anywhere on the piece of paper. However, things change when we look at a sphere. Because now at any point, if I draw a little segment, it's not easy to tell, but that segment has curved outwards just a little bit. And that outward curvature, we say, is positive Gaussian curvature. And if I do the same thing perpendicular, that segment has curved outwards as well. So since we have a positive times a positive, then we say at that point there is positive Gaussian curvature. And again, the same would apply to any point on the sphere. Now for negative curvature, I really couldn't find much around my apartment, but I think my electric shaver will do the trick. Right at this point, it's not everywhere, but right here, if I draw a little segment here, it curves outwards, gets that positive curvature. But if we go this other way perpendicular to it, it curves inwards, so negative. So that positive times negative curvature means at that point, there's a negative Gaussian curvature overall. A more general surface that has that negative Gaussian curvature would be something like a saddle shape or even the inside of a torus. But now, how do we figure this out for something like a cylinder, for example? Because at any given point, there are several segments I could draw through it that all curve a little differently. So what's the official way to figure this out? Well, if I want to find the Gaussian curvature at that point, I need to find the segment that goes through it with the most curvature and the one with the least and then multiply those together. So in this case, this is the segment with the most curvature. It curves outward just a little, so it's got that positive curvature. Then this segment, the one perpendicular to it, has the least curvature. In fact, this didn't curve at all, it just went straight down the side, so it has zero curvature. That means we have positive times zero curvature, which gives us zero Gaussian curvature at that point. But the same thing could be said about any point on the lateral surface of the cylinder. So yes, the cylinder is curved, but its Gaussian curvature is zero. 
So now we're ready for a theorem I found really interesting, and that's the theorem egregium, which was discovered by Gauss. And what this theorem says pretty much is that if you smoothly deform a surface, its Gaussian curvature at any point is not going to change. So because this has zero Gaussian curvature, the theorem says that this at every point has zero Gaussian curvature as well, which isn't too hard to see. If we take any point, like let's say right at the top, any point there, and find the Gaussian curvature, well, yes, one segment right here does curve, it has positive curvature. But remember, we have to find the segment with the least curvature, and that would be this one here, which doesn't curve at all, it's just a straight segment. So that zero times positive curvature leaves us with zero Gaussian curvature overall at that point. It didn't change. And the same goes for any point on the surface. So mathematically, it now makes a little more sense why I can wrap a piece of paper around a cylinder without there being any wrinkles or anything like that. Because we saw this is zero Gaussian curvature everywhere on the lateral surface. And when I deform this, it's zero Gaussian curvature is not going to change at any point. And thus it smoothly maps onto the cylinder with no wrinkles or distortion or anything like that. However, we saw that the sphere has positive Gaussian curvature. And because this must maintain its zero curvature as I deform it, then I cannot wrap a piece of paper around the sphere. And the math says if I were to try, it's guaranteed to crumple. And if this were, I don't know, a map, and I tried to wrap it around a globe, then we're guaranteed to have distortion. And if I try to give a piece of paper negative curvature, you see the same thing happens. Basically, you have to give it positive curvature here, but then we gotta bend it up this way, which if you try, it's just, it's not gonna happen without it uh, crumpling just a little bit. Okay, now that we have some background with that, it's time to talk about people living on these surfaces. And by the way, we're assuming that these surfaces are all very large. Now, to a small creature living on these surfaces, whether it's a giant sphere, a flat plane, or a saddle, the area around you will appear to be flat and two-dimensional. So my question is, even though this is the case, can we determine we're on a curved surface without leaving it? Like, could we determine that the Earth is not flat without going into space or going all the way around? The answer is yes, but especially for this first explanation, you'd need very precise equipment. But let's assume the Earth is a perfect sphere. To figure that it in fact is not flat, one thing you could do is draw a circle on that surface of a known radius. Then from there you'd measure the distance around the circle or its circumference. And if the surface is curved, you'd notice that the circumference does not have a length of 2 pi r as it should. It'd actually be a little smaller if we're on a sphere. Because remember, in your eyes, you just walked in a perfectly straight line to trace out or measure that radius. But in reality, you curve just a little. That means the circle you drew would lie on a plane slightly inside the sphere, and would thus have a radius slightly smaller than the distance you walked. Meaning the circumference will be 2 pi times a value slightly less than that red r, which you thought was a flat line segment. And from this, you could conclude that you're on a surface with positive curvature, at least locally. If on the other hand, the circumference was greater than 2 pi r, you could conclude maybe you're on some saddle shape with negative curvature. Now, yes, this would be a difficult task on such a large, non-perfect sphere like Earth, but there is more we can do without going around the entire thing or leaving it. Because one of the biggest differences between curved surfaces is what you'll encounter when moving parallel to someone else. So if you and your friend started walking parallel to each other on a flat surface, you'd never get any closer or further apart. But if you're on a sphere and you and your friend started walking perfectly straight, you'd think you're walking parallel paths at first, but you'd slowly notice you and your friend getting closer together until your paths would eventually cross, even though you thought you were walking straight the entire time. And this is something that happens when you have that positive curvature. Or another thing you'd see on a flat surface is that if you started walking perfectly straight, then made a right turn, walked the same distance, and repeated this, it would take three turns before you got back to your original spot. But if you're on a sphere, it'd be possible for you to make two right angle turns before returning to your original position. This wouldn't always be the case, of course, but it is true that on a positively curved surface, the internal angles of triangles always add to more than 180 degrees. 
So if we go to Brilliant Sight, the secret to a problem like this, where you have to find the sum of all interior angles, is that longitudinal lines are always perpendicular to the equator, which is why they appear parallel, at least when they're very close. Then since they meet at the top, you have a triangle whose angles will definitely be greater than 180, and that excess will depend on that top angle in this case. Negatively curved surfaces, on the other hand, have internal angles that sum to less than 180. Which means if we want to see whether our universe is open, closed, or flat, aka does it have negative, positive, or zero curvature, we could make a big triangle and measure the internal angle since that directly relates to that intrinsic curvature of our universe. And scientists have done this before by looking at the cosmic microwave background, and they found that the universe is mostly flat, as in parallel lines behave as expected if there's no curvature. Kind of the least exciting answer, unfortunately, but on top of the small margin of error, the exact shape of our universe and its global topology are still up for debate. So we found that geometry in spaces that aren't flat, or non-Euclidean geometry, gets really weird, but there's still more we haven't seen. Like, in flat space, we know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. However, on a curved surface, we usually don't have straight lines. So we call the shortest path from point A to point B along a surface a geodesic. As an example, on a sphere, the shortest path between two points, or the geodesic, is always part of a great circle. A great circle is basically the largest circle you can draw around a sphere. So what you see here, or the equator, would be examples of that. You can think of geodesics as the paths we perceive to be straight as we walk along a surface, at least when that surface is very large. Like, if you went outside and started walking perfectly straight right now in any direction, assuming an ideal sphere, you'd be walking along some great circle of the Earth. These are also what we see for flight paths. Planes are traveling along geodesics. If you want to fly from New York to Madrid, you would not fly along the latitude line, as that's part of a small circle, which is not a geodesic, and therefore not the shortest path. You'd instead take a slightly different path, which is part of a great circle. But on a cylinder, for example, a geodesic looks more like a spiral. In fact, I know this is a geodesic because if you were to unroll a cylinder back to a flat plane, the geodesic should remain the shortest path, aka a straight line. But to relate this back to the universe, you first need to know that light naturally travels the path not of shortest distance, but of shortest time. When light travels from air to a new medium like glass, we notice it will refract, bending at a different angle. The reason is because that is the path that will make light go from point A to point B the fastest. Light doesn't travel as fast in glass compared to air, so although this may be the shortest path, it doesn't minimize time because in this case the light spends more time in the glass where it's moving slower. Now when light moves through the vacuum of space to minimize time it travels along geodesic curves which are typically straight lines but around massive objects light bends and because light follows geodesics we can say that mass bends those geodesic lines or really we can say that space is curved. Simply put if geodesics are not straight lines then there's some indication that the space is curved. And this was a huge breakthrough in proving that general relativity was in fact correct, seeing that it wasn't just things with mass that were affected by gravity. Okay, so far we've gone over Gaussian curvature, geodesics, and some non-Euclidean geometry. But we need one more thing. We need a way to calculate the distance between nearby points on curved surfaces. Because when it comes to a flat plane, this is really easy to do. Just give me any two points, and I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the distance between them. But if we want to be able to do this on curved surfaces, we need something else. And that brings us to the metric tensor. The metric tensor was discovered by a mathematician named Riemann, and it's this mathematical tool that allowed Einstein to complete his general theory of relativity. Now, if we have a flat plane and a vector going from the origin to 3 comma 4, which we'll just label with this notation, finding the length of that vector isn't very hard. We know the x component is 3, which I'll label delta x, and the y component is 4, which I'll label delta y. Now, I'm just going to deal with distances squared here, so I don't have to have any square roots, but this doesn't change anything. Anyways, we all know the general solution to find that distance squared is delta x squared times a constant, plus another constant times delta x delta y, plus another constant times delta y delta x, plus another constant times the change in y squared. Okay, I know that was probably frustrating since, of course, the distance squared is just delta x squared plus delta y squared, the good old Pythagorean theorem, 
which would tell us that the distance squared is 25 or the distance is 5. But the equation I put is still technically correct so long as we assign values of 1, 0, 0, and 1 to the constants respectively. But okay, why did I add those terms in? It's because the Pythagorean theorem only works in a flat space when you define your basis vectors very nicely. For this example, these were our basis vectors, which I'll label E1 and E2, just a unit vector in the x and y direction. So when I said 3 comma 4 was the vector, that just meant we take 3 E1s combined with 4 E2s and find the distance from the tail of the first to the tip of the last. But now what if instead we use these as our basis vectors to describe any point? Because now that same coordinate would be considered 1 half E1 plus 2 E2. Now if you want to find the distance, the Pythagorean theorem will not work. 1 half squared plus 2 squared won't get us even close to 25. But if we use the general equation from before, we can make it work. The delta x and delta y are really just E1 and E2 you see here, so I'll just plug those in. Yeah, it's not very good notation since it's not really a delta x or delta y, but I'm just going to keep those consistent. Okay, now I wasn't going to do this, but for anyone who just needs to know where this almost Pythagorean theorem looking equation comes from, here's a quick explanation. When we have a vector like 3 comma 4, just like we saw earlier, which I'll write with i hat and j hat components now, to find the length squared, we can take the dot product of the vector with itself. To do this, most of you guys know we multiply the x or i hat terms together, and then add that to the y or j hat terms multiplied together, yielding a distance squared of 25, just like before. And when we have technically the same thing with those strange basis vectors now, to find the distance squared we still do the dot product, but it'll look a little different at first. Because technically to do the dot product we have to essentially foil, making it 1 half e1 dot 1 half e1, the first terms, plus 1 half e1 dot 2 e2, the outer terms, then the same thing with the inner terms, and then the last. This is how we find the vector length squared, and know that these are dot products, not multiplication symbols. In fact, this is what we did beforehand. The 3 times 3 came from 3i dot 3i, and 16 came from 4j dot 4j. But we forgot the outer terms of 3i dot 4j, and the inner terms of 4j dot 3i. It's just that since the i hat and j hat, or x and y direction, are at right angles to each other, when we do a dot product, those terms will just come out to zero. So in summary, the 1 half and 1 half, or 1 half and 2, and so on, correspond to the delta x and delta y. Whereas the actual dot product of E1 and E1 or E1 and E2 correspond to the constants. I'll put more detailed links down below, but just to get to the point, these are the constants that make everything work for this choice in basis vectors. You can go ahead and do the math, but it will come out to 25. Those constants of 16, 2, 2, and 17 fourths I'll organize a little better in a matrix because this here is our metric tensor. And what we saw before with the Pythagorean theorem, where the constants were 1, 0, 0, 1, well, that's also a metric tensor. Now this is kind of a boring example, because both metric tensors dealt with flat space. But it showed the general idea, and that is when the Pythagorean theorem fails, whether it be for weird basis vectors, or more importantly, those right triangles being on curved surfaces, the metric tensor makes the necessary corrections, allowing us to find those distances and fully describe the curvature of that surface. You'll find the metric tensor is typically written with the letter G and some subscripts. In order to describe higher dimensional surfaces, we just expand the matrix. For three dimensional space, the metric tensor would look like this, but we can keep going. As for four dimensional space time, it looks like this. 16 numbers, which is really just 10 because of the symmetry these have, is all we need at each point in four dimensional space to completely describe how that space is curved. So again, this identity matrix represents flat space where there is no curvature, as this is where the Pythagorean theorem holds. But this extends to higher dimensions, where this 3x3 identity matrix just leads to the distance formula in three dimensional flat space. And although it's not really a topic for this video, we can see something similar in the Minkowski metric. It's not exactly the identity, but it is used for flat Euclidean spacetime in four dimensions, and it encompasses the postulates of special relativity, like the speed of light being the same in all reference frames. But when it comes to general relativity, spacetime is now curved, leading to a more complex metric. 
Although that is of course beyond a video like this, in Einstein's equations we saw earlier, on the side that represents the curvature of space-time, we see the metric tensor that helped make that possible. Now once general relativity was accepted in the scientific community, it completely changed the way we understood gravity. You may have heard before that gravity is in fact not a force, and this was a result of general relativity. We used to think of gravity as some magical force between two objects that happens over a distance. But now we say there is no force, it's just the curvature of space-time. So like when you throw a ball through the air, we like to think it's accelerating downward due to the force of gravity. But Einstein said this is the wrong way to look at it. In fact, since there's no force, we can say the object is moving along a straight line in space-time. While this may sound crazy, this comes from the fact that flat space is being warped by the mass of the Earth, curving space-time around it. The parabolic path we see is just an illusion because we can't perceive that underlying curvature. So hopefully you're seeing that the mathematics of our universe runs pretty deep and of course we haven't even scratched the surface. But what about those mind-bending theories regarding our universe and what goes beyond it? Like what about the math that only works in 26 dimensions? Or the shapes that theoretical physicists think could describe higher dimensions of space-time? Well all that stuff is coming in the next video. But if you've made it this far, you probably enjoy this kind of content, and if you're looking to gain a deeper understanding of what we covered here, I highly recommend checking out Brilliant.org, who I'd like to thank for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is an educational platform that hosts over 50 interactive math and science courses. They not only teach you the technical information you need to know for the various subjects, but they also challenge you with interactive practice problems, programming, and just in general a more hands-on approach, so you have a real fundamental understanding of what you're learning. If you're like me and really enjoy the unique applications of mathematics, then you won't be disappointed by what they have to offer. If you like the topics in this video, for example, then their astronomy course would definitely be something you'd enjoy. It starts off by going over the essential technical information to get you started with astronomy and astrophysics topics, but then it goes more into what you saw earlier, such as geodesics, surfaces with different curvature, and the mathematics of non-Euclidean geometry as it pertains to the shape of the universe. Then they go much further covering dark matter, dark energy, black holes, and more. If you're looking to understand more of the strange mysteries about our universe, I highly recommend checking this out. And they're adding new courses all the time, like recently they came out with a puzzle science course where anyone can develop foundational physics knowledge while playing around with fun interactive puzzles. And for the more advanced people, they have things like differential equations courses that go beyond what I even saw in my college curriculum, so there's something for everyone to learn. So if you want to get started right now and support the channel, you can click the link below or go to brilliant.org slash major prep to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the major prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit the bell if you're not being notified and I'll see you all in the next video.